For the Investing News Network, I am Brian McGovern, and I'm joined today by Richard Carlton, the CEO of the Canadian Securities Exchange. Richard, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure, Brian. Thank you. Richard, we're going to be talking a little bit about psychedelics investments today and how quickly that market has changed in Canada and overall. First, can you give me some background on the CFC's involvement with this sector? Yeah, I mean, as you know, Brian, um, our calling card uh, certainly over the last few years has been uh, through our support of the cannabis industry, uh, first in Canada, uh, then in the United States, and then uh, globally. And, uh, you know, it's certainly true that a significant percentage of uh, both our issuers and market capitalization uh, is made up of uh, companies uh, in the cannabis space, uh, you know, from, from various aspects of it. And uh, I think it was about a year ago uh, when we began to hear from uh, some companies or prospective companies that were uh, facing the same kinds of issues that cannabis uh, uh, companies did in the early days, which was uh, they were looking to pursue business opportunities uh, in the psychedelic space, whether it was uh, uh, researching uh, the uh, therapeutic benefit of particular compounds uh, as a nutraceutical uh, or uh, one of the business plans or a few business plans that we, we saw involved uh, uh, therapy uh, in jurisdictions uh, where these uh, compounds were not uh, illegal or controlled substances. And uh, again, they had the same challenges because uh, conventional private equity, venture capital, angel groups, and so on, um, were not all that interested uh, in uh, investing in these companies at an early stage. And so taking the lead from the cannabis space, um, they were looking to the public equity markets uh, for uh, growth capital uh, in order to get these, uh, these, these companies uh, up, and, uh, up and running. And uh, again, we engaged with the uh, founders of these companies on what we expected the uh, disclosure issues uh, to be, the areas of focus that they needed to look at in their listing statements. Um, and again, uh, we drew a lot of uh, uh, a lot from our experience with the cannabis space and understanding what the regulators would be looking for. I mean, the securities regulators. And uh, as a result, uh, uh, over the last uh, couple of months, uh, we've seen uh, a few companies uh, reach the Canadian Securities Exchange uh, with uh, business plans uh, oriented uh, towards uh, 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 building businesses or developing businesses. Uh, in the psychedelic space. You mentioned the expertise that the CSC has had with cannabis listings and making sure that all the uh, rules and regulations are in place for, for these businesses to go public. Do you see any other similarities between cannabis and psychedelics in terms of the investment story and sort of the path that the two markets are taking? Well, I think there's a huge difference um, in, uh, and, you know, right off, uh, right off the bat, cannabis is a consumer packaged good, ultimately, whether it's for wellness or um, uh, adult uh, recreational use, for example. Um, and it has a, a known market, right? The illicit market in Canada, the United States and elsewhere. Uh, we have a reasonable idea what the addressable market is uh, in the cannabis space. In the um, psychedelics arena, it's, we're not talking about adult recreational use, uh, certainly in the near term uh, for any of these compounds, uh, nor uh, is the existing illicit market for, for most of these drugs, uh, you know, material uh, in any way, say in comparison uh, with, the, uh, with the cannabis industry. It's really a pharma play. And, you know, pharma's uh, path through the public markets is actually quite well understood, right? There's no real new ground that's being broken here. You have, um, uh, you know, some folks who have worked very, very hard uh, uh, through their and, and through their belief uh, in the efficacy of a number of these compounds in dealing with, um, you know, serious uh, health issues, uh, whether it's uh, addiction or depression, uh, PTSD, all of which um, are recognized, uh, in, in fact, potential health crises uh, as we speak. And uh, uh, significant addressable market potentially, uh, especially if you talk about displacing uh, some of the current treatments for depression, uh, which are, I believe, a couple hundred billion dollars in Canada, the United States alone. 
but the 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 path to uh, uh, to to growing these companies again is very well defined. You have to go through the FDA clinical trials, and uh, you know Canada has a very, very similar process where you do preclinical, and then if uh, um, you know the the results warrant uh, further investment, then phase one, phase two, phase three, and of course no startup is going to take a drug from preclinical all the way through to uh, phase three approval combined with uh, then commercializing it. Instead, what happens is along the way, they will take funding uh, from a big pharma operator to help advance that research. Uh, because again, I've seen numbers that suggest that uh, taking a, a single compound from preclinical to phase three approval by the FDA is anywhere from an 11 to $18 billion exercise. So very, very capital intensive. And so the work of the folks that are bringing these companies to market at this point is really to advance those projects, to conduct the research, to uh, justify further investment uh, mm -hmm. from whether it's uh, you know uh, in the public markets or joint ventures or other arrangements uh, that they make um, uh, with both private equity folks that uh, are uh, experienced in the space, and then ultimately to the uh, operators of Big Pharma. Richard, there's obviously a lot of interest and a lot of potential attached to the sector right now. In, in the big picture, you've already mentioned some of the potential that some of these compounds have for, for treatment uh, options. Um, Moving forward, what are some of the signs that you're looking for to be encouraged that the sector is heading into the right place for uh, growing up or sort of as an investment vehicle that, that you feel like it's going in the right way? Well, we've already seen a number of them, and that is the FDA itself. And, and you know, nobody would ever accuse the FDA of being anything other than extremely conservative. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, fast tracking uh, or uh, giving approvals uh, for companies to uh, move uh, or to advance uh, from a particular, you know, from one phase to the next. But we've seen uh, some of these uh, uh, early uh, research companies get fast track approval to go to uh, phase two um, and uh, on the basis that the preliminary work that was done uh, was so promising. Uh, on issues that have proven to be so difficult for conventional uh, therapies to treat that it merited, again, this kind of accelerated timeline uh, to um, gather more data uh, with a view to, in fact, bringing these uh, compounds into the mainstream. So, as I say, I think there's been uh, a lot of favorable um, uh, information in the marketplace already. And... Uh, uh, which is obviously no guarantee that uh, you know you you, you will have uh, an accepted treatment and full-on FDA and Health Canada approval, but certainly the signs are encouraging. One other thing I would like to point out, and you know this is you know the basis of the learning and the exposure that I've had to some of the leaders in the field over the last year or so, is that uh, for many of these compounds, whether it's uh, uh, you know ones that uh, have been used. Uh, by humans, uh, you know, for four to five thousand years, uh, uh, or uh, whether it was the compounds that were invented by twentieth uh, uh, century chemistry, like LSD and uh, MDMA. Um, but uh, there was a lot of good clinical work that was done in the fifties into the early sixties before um, you know the war on drugs and uh, the Controlled Substances Act came into being in the United States. Um, Some very very favorable research, uh, particularly on an addiction treatment, um, which has proven to be extremely difficult with the therapies that we have in place now. Uh, the recidivism rate, whether it's uh, alcoholism or in particular um, opioid uh, um, uh, issues, uh, is very poor uh, where we're at now. And uh, you know the numbers that were generated, as I say, back in the 1950s, including from Russia of all places, um, were very, very encouraging. Um, so I think that's one of the things that uh, over and above the work that's being done now is that uh, it's not just anecdotal, but there was in fact a fair amount of uh, a good body of research that was done in the 50s before it was abandoned. And many of these or most of these substances were placed on the controlled substances list, which effectively meant that uh, no serious researcher was going to compromise their career 
uh, <laughs> their future prospects or whatever by working uh, with this, uh, you know, those range of uh, that range of chemistry. So based on the conversations that you're having with uh, companies that are looking to list or maybe companies already out there, would you say that you, you are encouraged then by the kind of research that we're getting now or maybe even uh, the, the potential of, of this research? As you mentioned, there was a big sort of blockage in the salvage tube, a lot of, the, a lot of that research being done in the past. And now it seems to be picking up, but also this kind of stuff takes a lot of time for sure. It, it does. And, and again, that's what people uh, who are looking to invest in the space have to understand. Uh, again, this isn't a, uh, you know, a, a cannabis uh, consumer packaged good opportunity where with the proper licenses and a proper go to market strategy and so on that uh, revenues, significant revenues can start flowing within a year or two of the establishment of the company. Here, in some cases, um, you know, say like a junior mining company, um, they may be no expectation of revenues at all uh, for the particular company, right? The promise is that they get acquired uh, or the shareholders benefit through some kind of joint venture arrangement with an operator uh, once the uh, research into the particular compound has advanced a particular uh, uh, length. And, and you're correct to point out that that's a very, very different investment proposition than the cannabis story where in fact things might happen uh, a little faster. And uh, you know, to, to be honest, uh, that's one of the concerns that we have that uh, you know, some retail investors may be jumping on board thinking it's cannabis 2.0 and not really doing any more research than that. Um, and uh, you know, we certainly would be concerned uh, if uh, uh, retail investors were in fact jumping in uh, without having done the research and, and understanding the background of the particular teams, as well as uh, you know what the nature of the business here, which is, as I say, uh, a pharma play, not a consumer packaged goods play. From the perspective of the Canadian Securities Exchange, do you have a roadmap or maybe a vision of, of how many listings maybe that, that will be related to psychedelics by the end of 2020? You know, I really don't. Um, there's no doubt that um, uh, it will be, you know, a reasonable number, whether it's uh, 10, 15, 20 companies uh, that, that, that we see. And as I mentioned at the outset, um, you know, they may take different, uh, uh, different approaches, right? So that they may not all be uh, pure research type companies. Uh, we've, as I say, we've seen companies that are looking to, um, for example, set up an addiction treatment facility in a country where the particular compound they're using uh, is legal. And so if you're suffering from issues, you can travel to that country, undergo a course of treatment over a period of weeks, um, and then, you know, return in, in future. So, so that's obviously a different business uh, than somebody who's uh, uh, doing pure pharmacological research. Um, we also have some folks that are looking at uh, uh, wellness opportunities um, that are uh, below the uh, uh, psychoactive level. Uh, think of it as, I guess, the CBD of the, <laughs> the psychedelics, I guess. Uh, and again, uh, operating in jurisdictions uh, where uh, the compounds involved are, uh, are legal. And uh, again, from the exchange's perspective, um, as we did in the cannabis space, uh, we require positive uh, uh, statements from the company supported by legal opinions um, that the jurisdictions uh, that they are operating in uh, support or permit uh, the kind of business activity that they're engaged in. Um, and that's something that uh, is, a, is a key part of the due diligence that we perform uh, on these companies before they listen. And as the last thing, Richard, can you tell me about the first time you heard about psychedelics as an viable investment opportunity and what was your reaction to that? Uh, yeah, it, it probably goes back a year or two. Uh, I can't remember when it exactly was, um, you know, because I'm uh, you know, <laughs> aging and, uh, you know, I don't remember things as well as I, as I once did. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, will, uh, I will admit um, I, I was uh, a little skeptical at first, uh, but then I did have, as I mentioned, uh, the privilege of meeting with a number of the folks who have uh, literally sacrificed everything um, uh, in order to pursue 
um, the uh, you know these compounds uh, as treatments for significant health issues that cost our economy you know billions and billions of dollars on an annual basis. And uh, when I you know again began to understand that there was a significant amount of uh, clinical research, like hard data that existed, way more than what we had for the cannabis space uh, moving into uh, uh, adult recreational use in North America uh, over the last few years. Uh, on the efficacy of a number of these approaches, um, that really opened my eyes uh, because, uh, sure, I mean, I might have read Timothy Leary back in the day and Aldous Huxley and, uh, you know, some of the other uh, 20th century uh, advocates uh, for the uh, psychedelic space. Um, but uh, as I say, I, I'm, I'm convinced that there's something there. Uh, and uh, uh, as I say, I, I'm, I'm pleased and humbled that, uh, you know, we have these folks that were committed as they were to advance this cause. As I said, I think the cannabis uh, experience that we've had generally has helped that along. And uh, as I say, I really look forward to uh, some of the treatment options uh, that uh, uh, appear to be on the, on the road to being developed uh, because the problems that, that we're facing as a society uh, are enormous. Uh, Stress has never been higher uh, for, for folks across Canada, the United States, and the rest of the world. And uh, you know, we need to have more therapeutic approaches to responding to these issues. Okay, we'll leave it there. Richard, thank you so much for your time again today. Thank you, Brian. It's a pleasure. For the Investing News Network, I've been Brian Minerva. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel to keep getting all of our video interviews. We'll see you next time.